Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start now. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, Weidmannstaden ferrite. And the term Weidmannstaden comes from uh, meteorites. This is a picture that I took of a really large meteorite at the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. And they had actually a section of it cut. And you can see these plates, which are enormous, because uh, basically these things cool at something like a million uh, degree, uh, sorry, uh, one degree per million years when they're traveling through space. So you get huge crystals. These, uh, uh, the pattern in which these crystals form, because they form on particular crystallographic planes, is known as a Weidmannstaden pattern as a generic term. But these crystals involve a huge amount of diffusion during their growth and so on. And that is not what we are going to talk about today. So the only thing common with meteorites is the sort of pattern that the plates form in. OK, so uh, this is our time temperature transformation diagram. And I explained to you that you can basically treat it as two C curves, one for the reconstructive transformations and the other for the displacive transformations. And we've considered already martensite <coughs> and uh, bainite. And today we are going to finish off the displacive transformations with Weidmannstaden ferrite. So uh, this was the basic uh, structure uh, defining the mechanisms. The pattern in which we have the atoms arranged in the austenite can be homogeneously deformed into a different pattern. But then there is the consequence that we get the shape deformation. Uh, whereas reconstructive transformations, uh, if I, if I uh, cut this triangle off and transport it to this side, so I retain the external shape, then that's the diffusion required to get reconstructive transformation. And in that process, you get a rearrangement of atoms. But there is a third mechanism, because in steels, we have two different kinds of atoms. We have the interstitial atoms and the substitutional atoms. And the interstitial atoms can move about at a far greater pace than the substitutional atoms, because there is no need to create vacancies. Okay, There's hundreds and hundreds of interstitial sites available. So basically, it's the jump between interstitial sites, the migration term instead of the creation of vacancy term, which also plays a role in substitutional solutes. You know, typically, the vacancy concentration for substitutional solutes is 10 to the minus 9. So it's very small. So for a diffusion jump, you need to get over a barrier, but you also need an empty site. In other words, you need to create a vacancy uh, next to your jumping atom. That's not the case for interstitial atoms, and they can move quickly. <coughs> so is it possible that when we have atoms in interstitial sites, you can get a displacive transformation, which is uh, controlled by the diffusion of interstitial atoms? Now, there is another way of looking at these transformations. Uh, this is a, a military transformation. So we have a queue of soldiers there. And you know they are labeled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When they board the bus, the sequence is maintained. That means we have an atomic correspondence between the location in the bus and the location in the queue. And uh, there might be a lot of strain, because uh, you know soldier 2 may not want to be next to soldier 3, but is nevertheless has to sit there because it's a disciplined movement of atoms. Um, you contrast that with civilian uh, uh, transport. We've got a queue. As soon as the bus comes, you know they rush in a disorderly manner and occupy seats next to their friends. So it's a low strain energy situation. And there is a third possibility, okay, that you have both interstitial atoms and substitutional atoms. And these are forced to go onto the bus in a disciplined manner, whereas they do whatever they like and settle in positions which give the lowest free energy. So for example, partition into the austenite. So we call this a paramilitary transformation. And Weidmannstaden ferrite is like that, that the crystal structure change is achieved by a displacement but the carbon partitions during the transmission uh, so that it, it minimizes its free energy. Okay? 
So, we expect that the transformation happens slowly even though it is a displacive transformation it is not at a temperature where substitutional atoms are very mobile. Everyone happy with that? So, this is a third category of transformations and uh, this is a schematic uh, diagram of what Wittgenstein Farad looks like. The first thing is that you have thin wedges right. So, it is no longer lenticular plates, but wedge shaped objects and when they form directly from the austenite grain boundaries. So, this is an austenite grain they are known as uh, primary Wittgenstein ferrite plates and if they form from the ferrite then they are known as secondary. Now, that is just terminology you do not need to worry about it they are both essentially the same phase. So, what whatever morph morphology we observe we need to explain in terms of atomic mechanisms and this is an optical micrograph uh, of what Wittgenstein and Farad looks like. You can see the thin wedge uh, shapes and also in this case uh, growing from allotriomorphic uh, from ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries. Now, another thing I wanted to notice is that these plates are coarse. You can see it is about uh, the scale at the bottom is 20 micrometers right. Remember with bainite we were talking about a quarter of a micrometer and furthermore when we etch they appear to be clean right. So, they appear white compared with the background and that indicates that there is no structure inside the plates right no structure which is attacked by uh, chemical etchants okay. So, you can easily distinguish Wittgenstein ferrite from bainite from the coarseness of the plates which you can resolve using optical microscopy and the fact that they etch white. Now, we can look at uh, the displacements caused by the transformation uh, in a number of different ways. We have already seen with bainite we used atomic force microscopy because the plate size is very small uh, and therefore, you need to resolve something less than a quarter of a micrometer in size. But if you have scratches on your austenite before it transforms then the scratches themselves are, are deflected. So, uh, if, if you look over here this is a scratch which was present in the austenite as a straight scratch and it has been deflected by the formation of uh, Wittgenstein ferrite. Again look at the scale here this is quite coarse and similarly we can use um, interference fringes you know. So, basically uh, if we have a, a sort of a half mirror parallel uh, not parallel to the surface, but slightly inclined to the surface then you get interference between the reflected and the incident beam and every so often it is out of phase. So, you get a series of fringes which basically define the surface displacement and you can see this fringe is sheared and there is another shear on this side as well ok. So, when we do these measurements accurately on Wittgenstein and ferrite we find uh, well I will come back to that. Uh, first of all uh, we note that Wittgenstein ferrite has only a small undercooling below the reconstructive transmissions uh, and it forms at temperatures about T0. That immediately tells you that it is impossible for it to be a completely diffusionless transmission, right? Because you know you have to form below T0 in order for um, diffusionless transmission to be possible. Uh, Carbon diffusion is therefore essential during transformation. There is no question it must diffuse during transformation if it is forming above the T0 temperature. Okay, so, let us look at the shape change in a little bit more detail. Uh, so, the diagram on the left is what you would expect if there is a single plate of Wittgenstein ferrite forming. You get a single tilt of the surface and on either side the surface uh, remains flat, but suppose that you have two plates forming simultaneously right. Then you would not see a just a step, but you would see a sort of a tent shaped surface relief and that is exactly what we saw in that interference micrograph and the scratches being displaced. So, what is happening is that there are two plates forming simultaneously 
which accommodate each other's shape deformation. Now, why is this? Uh, well, I've already explained that it forms at a small undercooling. You know, for, for Martin's side, you had a table which said, you know, this is the strain energy and this is the interfacial energy and so on, the twin boundary energy. So it's of the order of 600 joules per mole, which is huge, okay? So that sort of a strain energy cannot be uh, provided by a small undercooling. You know, the chemical driving force is much smaller than 600 joules per mole. So instead of single plates forming, you have two plates forming together, which cancel out each other's shape change. Okay. So the stored energy in the case of Wiedemann-Stern ferrite is really much smaller. It's uh, 50 joules per mole. So to summarize, there are two plates which form simultaneously. in order to accommodate uh, so that the stored energy is reduced, the stored energy due to the shape deformation is reduced something of the order of 50 joules per mole and by comparison if we look at Martin site that term for a single tilt is 600 joules per mole so by these two plates forming simultaneously you basically partly cancel out the shape deformations uh, and therefore you reduce the elastic strain energy term However, there is a cost. However, there is a cost. First of all, the nucleation rate is dramatically reduced because you have to form these self accommodating plates simultaneously. So, nucleation rate is dramatically reduced. reduced and the consequence of this is that you end up with a coarse microstructure which can be bad for toughness so if you are trying to make strong steels this is something to avoid Now, this also explains the shape, which is uh, in the form of a wedge, because every single plate, the shape deformation, the orientation relationship, and the habit plane are mathematically connected by the theory of Martinsite. We saw that in the Martinsite lecture. Yeah? So, if you have one plate with a shape deformation, which has a shear pointing upwards, and another with a shear pointing approximately parallel but downwards, they've got to have different variants of the habit plane. So, for example, here you have uh, W1 with the habit plane 585 gamma and W2 with a habit plane uh, 558 gamma, which means that there is an angle between these two, right? And that is why the shape of the plate is in the form of a thin wedge. Okay, is everyone happy with that? Now, there isn't any structure in here. But we should be able to see uh, a boundary, a, a, a low misorientation boundary between W1 and W2. And indeed, you see that when you look at what appears optically to be an individual plate, you will see a boundary going along because it's actually two plates growing simultaneously back to back. Okay? Right. Uh, 
we now need to think about uh, how fast we expect this plate to grow. So we are going to go into some uh, theory for diffusion control growth. All right. So if I want to work out the chemical composition I expect at the interface, then basically, you know, the carbon will build up at the interface in the uh, between the Wittgenstein ferrite and austenite until it reaches the equilibrium concentration. Okay. So you'll accumulate carbon at the interface until um, the equilibrium composition of the austenite at the transformation temperature is reached. So if I'm transforming at this temperature and C bar is the average concentration and C alpha gamma means that is the concentration in ferrite which is in equilibrium with austenite and C gamma alpha means the concentration in austenite which is in equilibrium with ferrite. So you know it's wrong to talk about solubility of carbon in something. It's always with respect to another phase with which it is in equilibrium. Okay. So C alpha gamma is the solubility of carbon in ferrite that is in equilibrium with austenite and similarly for C gamma alpha. Then once steady state conditions are established, we expect the concentrations at the interface to be given by a tie line of the phase diagram. A tie line, uh, are you familiar with tie lines? Yeah. So but they basically link the equilibrium concentrations. So this cannot be higher than C gamma alpha and therefore the plate will only grow at a rate at which you can carry away the carbon by diffusion along this gradient. And this gradient is not a straight line, right? It, it's an error function, but I've drawn it as a straight line as an approximation because it doesn't change the essence of what we are going to derive and it makes everything so much easier to follow, okay? So it's a straight line and therefore I can define a diffusion distance uh, delta z. Now as this plate grows, this profile will be displaced okay, like so. In other words, uh, the shaded red area is the amount of carbon that has been pushed ahead of the interface. Okay. So if I multiply the velocity of the interface, which is uh, Z star is the position of the plate tip um, along the coordinate Z, then dZ star by dt is the velocity and the rate at which we are pushing solute is C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma is, is this difference here. That's the rate at which solute is being pushed ahead in a time interval de delta t. Yeah, is everyone happy with that? So that concentration profile moves as a function of time and therefore you've pushed that much carbon into the austenite, leaving behind a low carbon ferrite. Everyone clear with that? Okay, so that's the rate at which solute is partitioned. Now to maintain the concentration here at C gamma alpha, that excess carbon must be carried away by diffusion. So we have a second, uh, second equation here that this is the flux at the interface which is simply the diffusion coefficient times the concentration gradient. All right. Now given that we've got a, a straight line as our concentration gradient, uh, the gradient is simply given by the difference between C gamma alpha C bar divided by delta Z. Right. So this is the diffusion flux here. The minus sign has disappeared because I've changed the order here. Okay. So you know, in all of uh, the theory for diffusion control growth, you basically have these two conditions that the rate at which solute is partitioned must be equal to the rate at which solute is taken away from the interface by diffusion. Okay. Now we have uh, one unknown here which is the diffusion distance delta Z. <coughs> so how do I solve that? Right. So if you look at the distribution of carbon ahead of the Wiedemann-Sand ferrite, uh, at the tip 
you know, basically the diffusion distance remains constant because we are not accumulating carbon at the tip, it's being left behind on the sides of the plate, right? So the diffusion distance is constant. So how do you expect the growth rate to be a function of time? If the diffusion distance is constant, uh, what do you expect the growth rate to be? constant as well okay uh, but I need to I, I need to specify what the diffusion distance would be and a good approximation is that it's given by the radius of the tip of the plate so this is our diffusion distance which you had in the previous graph and we simply replace that by the tip radius of the plate here okay do you have that diagram in your notes yeah so R is simply the radius of the tip of the plate and the best representation of the plate shape is a parabolic cylinder so a parabolic cylinder uh, is is this parabola extended along this direction okay that's the three dimensional shape of Wiedemann's Daden ferrite and you have your wedge shape reproduced and all the characteristics are defined by the uh, radius at the tip which is R. So if I take uh, my condition that the rate at which solute is partitioned is equal to the rate at which it's carried away by diffusion and rearrange this equation and uh, say that dz star by d t is the lengthening rate of the plate, so that's just a rearrangement of uh, that equation, then I get uh, the lengthening rate being equal to the diffusion coefficient divided by the tip radius and multiplied by terms from the phase diagram and the average composition of the steel. Okay. So the velocity should vary with 1 upon r. And, and you know that should immediately ring some alarm bells because if I reduce the tip radius to close to 0 then I will get an infinite growth rate, right? and basically we won't have any transformation because it's it's too small so if i plot a graph of the velocity versus tip radius i haven't actually solved the problem here because we haven't got any theory to specify the tip radius uh, then it would basically go to infinity as my tip radius decreases so something is missing here any ideas so it's a bit like in perlite, you know. Um, if you if you make the interlamellar spacing very very small, then the growth rate will increase because the diffusion distance decreases, right? So in the case of perlite, what controls the interlamellar spacing? Hmm? Interfacial, Interfacial energy. energy. So you know, as this plate grows and thickens, yeah. You imagine a thin para. Uh, parabolic cylinder and then it becomes a fatter you are creating interface okay and I'm going to show you the problem in a simple way so instead of a parabolic cylinder I'll just consider a parallel s parallel sides with a cylinder at the end with the radius R okay so let's go through how the creation of interface modifies our velocity equation. So the question we need to ask is how much interface is created when an atom is added to alpha W, Friedman's Staten ferrite. Well, uh, if we treat the plate the tip as a cylinder of length L and the tip radius R, then the area is given by 2 pi R L and therefore the A by the R is 2 pi L and the volume is pi R squared L and therefore dv by dr is 2 pi rl 
It follows, therefore, that dA, the change in area over a unit change in volume, is equal to 1 upon r. In other words, 2 pi L divided by 2 pi R L. And if the volume per atom is that, volume per atom, then the corresponding increase in area when I add an atom increase in area on adding an atom is simply Va over R. And therefore, the increase in energy due to the addition of an atom uh, and the creation of interface is interfacial energy increases by sigma Va upon R, where sigma is joules per meter squared, in other words, the interface energy per unit area. Energy per unit area. Now, if delta G R is the interface energy, sorry, if we write delta G infinity as the free energy change per atom, per atom, when a flat interface moves, in other words, we are not creating any interfacial area, then when a curved interface moves with a radius r, then that is equal to delta G infinity less this term here, which is sigma Va upon r. And at a critical tip radius, at r equals a critical value here, delta G r becomes zero because the energy consumed in creating an interface is equal to the chemical driving force for transformation. And therefore, we can write that delta G infinity is equal to sigma Va upon the critical radius. Uh, and this delta G R becomes equal to sigma Va into 1 upon the critical radius minus 1 over the actual radius, which is equal to sigma Va into 1 minus Rc over R. Now we know that velocity scales with the driving force, so we expect the velocity to scale with this term. delta G R, okay. Now, you know that velocity scales with driving force. So, if I simply take my growth rate equation that we derived without considering interface energy and scale it by this quantity here, then that will give me the velocity uh, function. Okay, I'm going to switch over. Everyone happy with this so far? Right, so this was the equation we had, and we've got to multiply it by that term 1 minus Rc over R. Um, okay, this is just a revision of what I've explained on the board, that we take this cylinder, and therefore we work out that the cost of uh, creating uh, an interface is sigma Va upon R, and we end up with this term here to scale the velocity. Okay, And that is the equation that we finally get. And if I now plot that equation, I get a curve where the velocity is 0 at r equals rc. And without considering interface energy, this go just goes on to infinity. All right? So we've got a curve here representing the velocity as a function of the plate tip radius. So we don't actually have a plate tip radius as yet. 
we simply have a function of velocity with plate tip radius. So, how can I fix the plate tip radius? What would be a, a reasonable assumption? The maximum of that curve. Yeah. So we we assume that the plate will grow at its fastest possible rate, which would be the maximum in this curve, and there is no fundamental reason, uh, which uh, there's no fundamental theory which allows you to pick a radius. So it could be, for example, the maximum. It could be the maximum entropy production rate or it could be the maximum velocity at which the interface uh, is stable. You know, like in dendritic growth, you know, if you have a flat interface, it tends to uh, develop into dendrites, right? That's because of interface instabilities. But let's pick the velocity which, uh, uh, pick the tip radius which gives us the maximum velocity. And the only way you can verify whether your assumption is correct or not is by comparison against experimental data. Okay, so here are some measurements of the lengthening rate versus that calculated. And you can see that um, we get a velocity which is somewhat greater than the maximum value. Right? Now, remember that we are assuming a nice, neat parabolic cylinder shape and so forth. So, you know, getting it wrong by 5 micrometers per second, which is the difference between those two curves, is not a big deal. And you can see that for a whole variety of different alloys, the growth rate follows that, uh, you know, there's good agreement between experiment and theory, okay? <coughs> okay, um, I'm going to show you now uh, a movie uh, which shows displacive transformation happening slowly. All right, so at a growth rate which is consistent with what we've calculated, all right? So we are starting with austenite, which is uh, polished flat. And, you know, y if, if you recall the earlier movies that I showed you, which had very rapid growth rates, and in the case of martensite, it basically appears like a mountain range immediately. So, notice the temperature, uh, sorry, that's the time, but the temperature is in red, um, relatively high compared with bainite formation temperatures or martensite formation temperatures. See, can you see that plate growing steadily? And can you also see that there's a tent-like surface relief because there's a dark side here and a relatively bright side on the other side? So it's really quite remarkable, you know, this is displacive transformation where we're changing the crystal structure by a deformation, uh, yet it's occurring at a rate controlled by carbon diffusion. So thi this is uh, very neat, I think. You can clearly see the displacements on two plates growing together, plus they're not suddenly shooting across the grain, but growing at a steady rate, which is consistent with the simple theory that we've just developed. Okay. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the mechanism of crystal structure change is displacive, and therefore we get the strain energy terms but the strain energy is mitigated by two plates growing simultaneously. But there is a consequence that the structure, therefore, is very coarse because you have dramatically reduced the, grow, uh, the probability of nucleation. Okay? You have to form these two specific plates simultaneously, and therefore the nucleation rate is a lot s smaller than if you just had enough driving force to form one plate. So pairs of plate grow together in order to um, minimize the strain energy. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so that finishes the displacive transformations.
And in the next lecture, I will start with uh, the formation of ferrite, which forms at high temperatures, and everything is able to diffuse, not just carbon. Okay. <laughs>